Track number one, capacity building. I'm Robert Ostry, and I'm the host for the last breakout of the summit. As a reminder, this track is being live streamed through our platform Q. We'd like to welcome our remote attendees. This last breakout session is going to be presented by Katherine Siebolt, CEO, Court Appointed Special Advocates. She'll be sharing the most effective way to build a long-lasting development strategy, a topic us, us foundation leaders always are looking for getting better at. So please join me in welcoming Katherine to share about this. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for being here at the last session on a Friday afternoon. I certainly appreciate that very much, especially if it's so beautiful outside. So I wanted to take a moment and kind of tell you a little bit about myself, because um, I think it's important to know who it is that's speaking up here. I'm not an authority on anything, and I'm not an expert, but I have been through the trials and tribulations of running a nonprofit. So right now, I run CASA of Orange County, which is Court Appointed Special Advocates. We've been around for 31 years. We are part of a national organization, but the difference is, is that we get branding from our national organization, but otherwise we get no other funding. So we all, every chapter of CASA, goes out and fundraises on their own for 100% of the proceeds that come in. Um, what we do is we actually train community volunteers to speak on behalf of a foster child in court. So many of our foster children have 40, 50 people representing them in court, attorneys, therapists, you name it, they're standing there. But nobody actually really knows the child one-on-one. -on -one. So not only is our advocate a mentor on behalf of this child, but they also are representing them and they're their voice to the judge. So often the judge will defer to a CASA rather than to a social worker to ask what that child needs. It could be tutoring, it could be being moved from the home that they're in, it could be additional therapy. So they take on a large responsibility, 30 hours of training, and we raise funding so that we're able to train these advocates. We have over 700 advocates currently, and we serve 800 children in the Orange County foster care system. There are a total of 2,300 children currently in foster care in Orange County, and that is from infancy all the way to age 18. Um, some opt to stay in the system until they're now 21, which is now legal in California. We operate on a $2.6 million budget. And I have a 30-person staff and 21 people on my board of directors. So a little bit about my background. I was a corporate CEO for almost 20 years. I happened to um, love everything about a children's charity and felt that if I was ever in a position to give back, I would. I was a board member for CASA for four years, and we were struggling both financially as well as having some leadership changes. I raised my hand and said I would like to step in as a CEO because I think not only do you need someone who understands the programs of a nonprofit, but you need somebody that understands the business side of a nonprofit. And we'll get into that a little bit more um, in a moment. So that's how I came to be the, uh, the CEO. My corporate career was in medical device. And I know one of the executives at Global Genes, she and I, I sat actually on her board of directors when she was president of Junior League of Orange County. Her name is Angie Rowe. Um, many of you probably are aware of who she is. So, and she has asked me um, to be here today. So, as a mission that you all know, Global Gene says that they're here to eliminate the challenges of rare diseases. So, I'm here today to hopefully eliminate the challenges of raising money. So, we're going to talk about um, some donor and business philosophy, as well as relationship building, funding diversity, and some tools and tips for you that I hope you can implement immediately. So before we start, I just wanted to see a show of hands. I'm assuming everyone here is already fundraising. Is, am I right? Everyone fundraising? OK. Um, is anyone here just starting out? OK, a few of you. Others, are, do you feel, raise your hand if you feel as though you're struggling to find those dollars, OK, and need perhaps new ideas on how to do so? All right, so we're all in the same boat. 
that's what I said. I'm not an expert, but hopefully I have some, some words of wisdom up here. So, um, I always say nonprofit is a business, and you need to know your business. A lot of people will say to you, oh, it's a nonprofit, and somehow there's this misconception or misperception that you don't run an actual business, but you do. You have expenses, you have revenues coming in, and though um, we're tax exempt, we still have to report to the government, and the government watches very closely what nonprofits are doing, especially in the last few years when things have changed. So I always say the first thing to do is, no matter what stage you are in your business, is to do a business assessment and see where you are in your business today. So one of the first things I did um, two years ago when I came on board at CASA was I took a look at these few things. One was the budget. Where are we? Is it the right budget? Who put that budget together? Did someone before me or an executive team before me really take a look at every line item or were they just plugging in numbers? Were the numbers realistic? What I had found out is that they made assumptions that much of the items that we have are donated, whether or not that be a meeting room such as this or a speaker such as me would be doing things for free. So rather than budgeting for those items, they would put zero. But what happens is one year you may get it for free, but the next year you may not. Either that speaker's not available, they're unable to do it for no cost, or the place that you normally have a rental, have a space, no longer can give it to you for free because their circumstances have changed. So what we found that there were significant deficits in the budget because they weren't accurately budgeting. So it's important to accurately budget, though you may get something for free. Monthly cash flow and expenses, extremely important to know. This is what got us in trouble. And we'll talk a little bit about restricted assets later. But cash flow, know exactly how much is going out. Whether or not you have employees, you have some sort of overhead, know exactly how much money you need every month in order to cover your, ca in order to cover your expenses. And understand the seasonality of fundraising. What I mean by that is we actually did a calendar we do many events, and there's two events, which I'm not thrilled about, but there's two events that pay for half my budget. So think about it. $2.6 million budget, two events cover $1.3 million of my budget. If something goes wrong with an event or a catastrophic event happens that day or the day before, I, I can close the doors at CASA. So diversification obviously is important. But seasonality is more important because what we find, especially for those people that are doing event type fundraisers, a lot of money going out before the fundraiser because you're paying those expenses and then you're waiting for donor dollars and sponsorships to come in. And they're not you know, what you anticipate, hoping that they're gonna come in 30 days prior to the event doesn't often happen. So that's important to map out your seasonality. And what you'll find is that where you have those gaps is where you need to think about what other type of fundraising activity can we do in the months that are not generating cash. So, um, and then identify your top 10 donors. It was interesting when I came on board and I asked the staff, who are our top 10 donors? They weren't able to tell me. Then I went to a database, and the database actually didn't tell me either, so I knew that we were in trouble. So always know who your top 10 donors are, when was the last time they gave, and how much they gave, and how they give. Do they give through an event? Do they just give um, an annual check at the end of the year? Like we have one donor who every year comes in on December 15th and tells us that the check will be there on December 31st because he's working with his tax accountant. The same amount comes in every year, but we need to know that, and we need to speak to him prior to that so we make sure that we budget for it. What tools do you have to track your, what I call, investors, your donors? A, a good database, and we'll talk about what that is and the fact that you do not need to spend a lot of money on something like that. What sources does your money come from? So are they just from individuals? Is it from corporations? Are you getting money from foundations, perhaps? Do you know the nonprofit accounting rules? Really important for nonprofits. And who are your supporters? These aren't necessarily your donors. These are other individuals in the community that can help you and support the cause that you're trying to raise money for. 
And then can you easily explain why you're asking for money? One of the toughest things at CASA to explain to somebody um, was what the child welfare system is like and what our advocates actually do. So we had to come up with a way a very, eas very easily and succinctly to be able to tell somebody in under 30 seconds, because that was about the span of time that you have for someone's attention. If they want to hear something, it'll click, and if they don't, they're off to the next subject. So we felt it was important at CASA to establish what we called a philosophy. And this was a philosophy not only about business and how we conduct our business, but also how we interact with our donors. So for us, it's about educating, partnering, and thanking. These are the three things that what we call our advancement team or the two women on my team that do fund development. This is what they do. So our business philosophy is that we have to be transparent with our financials. Anyone can look up a nonprofit's financials, especially if you have um, your Form 990. Typically, it's on a website. But anyone should be able to see how much the CEO makes and how much the other executives make, if any of your board of directors are paid, if you happen to have them, and what additional expenses you pay out. They also will see how much, is, um, how much you spend for expenses on any sort of large events that you do. So it's better to be upfront and tell people because if you don't, they'll find out just like everything on the internet nowadays. Um, we also talk about our struggles. We don't hide the fact if we're having challenges in hiring personnel or if we're having challenges with the budget. And um, our donors seem to appreciate the fact that oftentimes they only hear success stories and how great everything is going, but they often don't hear what the true struggle is. Not only with just the cause and the children that we're supporting, but what the true struggle is in business. Most of these people are business people. They understand that it's hard. They understand that there's certain things you can't cover in basic overhead. And it's important to let them know that. Without being able to pay your basic overhead and to maybe have one one, two, or ten employees, or just yourself, you have to be able to cover the expenses. Most people only want to cover the cause, but without being able to cover the expenses, you can't pay for the cause. So it's important for to have that balance and explain that to donors. Then we talk about an investment. We feel that our donors are investing in CASA. They're investing in our cause. They're investing in a mission. And that's a different way of looking at a donor. So if you think about that they can invest in, I think, over 5,000 5, charities just here in Orange County, there's a lot of different charities they can choose from on where they're going to invest their money. So what we want to do is make sure that the donor knows that if they've chosen to invest with you, that their donor dollars are safe, that they're going to the right place, that they're being used efficiently, that n no one is negligent in the organization, that they meet those of you that are involved in the fundraising, maybe it's just you, that they get to know you, they understand your practices, they understand your philosophy about business. We don't ask for donations up front. When we meet with a donor, perhaps it's a new donor or somebody that's been with us for a while, we typically are not asking for money. Our philosophy is that we educate them or update them on what's going on with the agency rather than asking for money. People will give money if they want to. If they're asked, oftentimes what we're finding is that you get money one time. They feel a little badgered or they feel a little, you know, displaced, they feel put in a corner, and they're like, okay, fine, we'll write that check for $100, or we'll write that check for $1,000. But you may never see another penny from that person. And the reason is, is that you didn't get them engaged or invest, get them invested in what you're doing. So we take the time in a first meeting to talk about you know, what's going on at CASA? Um, what does the future look like? Uh, how are we doing? Maybe tell a success story or something like that, and that's it, and just thank them for their time. And we have found that that goes a, a lot farther uh, than coming right out and saying, hey, we need money. <laughs> so, um, and that goes to educating about the cause, especially if they're a brand new donor. Oftentimes, it might be a friend of a friend that says, hey, you know, go talk to Catherine about CASA. She does this really great thing for kids. And they may not explain what we do well. And so much of the time is spent just really discussing 
you know, what does CASA do? How do we impact? What sort of impact we make in the community? How many kids we can serve? So focusing on that and educating someone brings them a lot further along in the donor cycle. And then we discuss how to partner together. We use the word partner on purpose. So traditionally, when you go out to raise money, it's called fund development. We changed our term to advancement because we feel that we're advancing a cause. And we need partners in order to advance our cause to support our children. And so that seems to be able to lend itself more to a story. When you're talking to somebody and saying, I want, to, I want to partner with you to help us advance our cause, it's a lot different than someone walking in with you know, the title on their card saying fund development, because that person's like, they are going to have their hand out and they're going to start asking for money. This way you can talk about building a partnership together. And then we always talk about the future. What do we have going on? Do we have a strategic plan? What's coming up in the near future for us? Is it budget time? Whatever happens to be going on at the agency at that time. So donor philosophy is find a commonality and know your donors. One of the things, especially new, so this is really pertains to kind of that new donor. You're mining a database or you're looking through magazines or newspapers and you're trying to, you know, you see somebody who's giving a ton of money to the local hospital in town. Well, you have to find out why. Because oftentimes it may not be for your particular cause. So you want to make sure that there's a commonality, that there's a reason, an attachment, that they want to be attached to your particular reason for fundraising. That's very important because if not, if they really don't understand what you're trying to raise money for and for whom and how it affects the child or the people with that rare disease that you're raising money for, it's going to be a one-time, maybe a two-time donation. But if you can really get them and you have that commonality, they understand it, they might have a personal attachment to it somehow, then they will continue giving. Otherwise, the next person that comes along and wants them to get involved in donating to their cause might be dogs, it might be the zoo, it could be something else. They'll go there because that might be an interesting story for this year, but not that passion and not that connection for years to come. And that's all about building relationships and partnerships. Once you know that you have that connection together and that you're on the same page and they have a passion for what you're doing, a lot easier to build a long-term partnership rather than a one-time donation. Then ongoing touch points. We feel that it's important because we failed at doing this for many years, was to say not only just thank you to the donors, but send out something to them, we do it quarterly. So we do a quarterly email to our donors, and that quarterly email looks different every time. One might be a success story about a child that maybe got adopted. One may be um, a print, like a picture of child's artwork. So we do, um, we tend to have a picnic every year for children, a back to school picnic for our foster kids, and we set up a booth and they can do hand prints. Um, and they, we ask them if they'd like to donate it back to CASA to give to someone who's been helping them, and oftentimes they will. Um, this last time, I think 200 children participated, and we had almost all of them give back their artwork to donate to a donor. And so we tend to take a picture of that, send it out with a story, and we just say, you know, Alice, age five. And um, donors really respond to something like that. And then most importantly, again, when I first took over, we met with each one of our donors and we just said thank you. We sent thank you cards. We met in person with the larger donors to say thank you. And we said, you know, we often forget just to say thank you. And we just wanted to thank you not only for the donation financially, but also for the time and the investment that you've put into our organization. Um, which makes it what it is today, and every dollar counts. We've had people often say, well, I can't give very much, and we continue to always say, but every dollar counts. Um, one of our staff members' daughters, she's very young and had a lemonade stand. She made a dollar twenty-five and put it in an envelope, and she said, for CASA. So every dollar really does count. So 
I think it's important to understand the rules of money in the nonprofit. I, you know, coming from corporate America, you know, I can read a P&L and I can do a budget, but there were certain nuances about nonprofit that I had not been exposed to in my corporate career, even though I knew it from being a board member. But once you're really sitting there and you're having to talk to the accountant and the auditor, you find out a whole lot of things that you were not privy to uh, in corporate life. So one is get a good auditor and get a good accountant. So extremely important, depending on how much money is moving. And like I said, we don't have a large budget, 2.6 million for many nonprofits. We're considered very small. But an auditor will guide you on what are the right things to do, what to report, whether or not you're spending too much money on events, and what you should be doing. The accountant to me is she's in my office every single day and we're looking at the books. A lot of times it's focused on cash flow. How much money do I have in the bank right now that I can use to pay overhead? So, but it's instrumental to have those two people. They don't have to be on staff, they can be consultants. And there are people that specifically auditors and accountants that specialize in nonprofit, which is extremely important that they understand what you're doing. And then what I found to be shocking when I first came on board was this notion of restricted assets. Is everyone familiar with restricted assets? Okay, a few of you. So this is a good example. I could have $2 million in the bank and still close my doors because I cannot afford to pay my overhead. Why is that? Because I have restricted funding. And what that means is that you go and get a grant or you go to a foundation that wants to give money to your cause. But they are very specific in how they're giving their money. So they may say to you, you can only use this money to pay for one child to go to this hospital to get this treatment. And they gave you more money than you would need for the treatment. So let's say they gave you just a number out of the air, $5,000. You only need 1000 But they wrote the check and they said, no, no, no. That donor doesn't understand restricted funding like we do. So what that means is you used $1,000 to pay for the procedure and you have $4,000 in the bank account. You will never be able to touch that money to pay for anything else other than what the donor intended it for. So if you're in trouble and you need, it just happens to be $4,000 to pay a bill for overhead, you can't touch it. So you have to go back to the donor, and the donor needs to release the money. And if they don't, there could be a situation where you have to return the assets back to the donor. Typically, a donor would not do that if they understand what you might need that asset released for, but you actually do need to get it in writing so that you know that it's no longer restricted. And then it can move to your general funding and pay for overhead or any other expenses that you may have. So we have a significant amount of money sitting, though we have a $2.6 million budget, significant amount of that money is tied up into restricted assets, which I cannot touch. I have about $220,000 a month that I need to come up with to pay for overhead. That includes my rent, staff, insurance, and things like that. And if I don't have that cash flow and that cash in the bank, I am in trouble. So something to really consider when you're talking to grantors and to foundations on how you write your applications to get money and how they grant it and what they put in their granting letter. Very, very important. This is where the auditor comes in and the accountant comes in. So this often is a question about how much of your annual revenues need to go to program expenses. And what program expenses mean is how much goes back to the cause? How much goes back to support exactly what you say that money goes to, what you're raising money for? And it's about 60 to 80 percent. And this is something that is audited. This is something that the auditor will look for. And this is also put on your 990. And it's a very easy calculation that can be done that you can look up. But it's usually 60 to 80 percent. If you do do events, whether it's a walkathon or a gala or anything like that, you want your event expenses to be 20% of your revenue target. 
that's very important that also is looked at on your 990s. So these are the two things that nonprofits get in trouble for. This is also what people that are giving grants and in charge of foundations are looking at. They're looking to see how much money you're spending on the expenses and how much is actually going back to the root cause of what you're doing. So there's a couple of resources I just put out here um, for California. The Attorney General's office puts out a guide for charities. So that's an important one to take a look at. It's only about, I think it's about 40 pages long, but it's, it's all in question and answer format, so pretty easy to get through. And you can find that online. And then the other thing is Charity Navigator. And the reason I put this up here is that if you are applying for grant money through foundations, um, most people will look you up on Charity Navigator. So take a look at it, and um, it, just gives, it just gives a rating about your financials, whether or not they can find them easily, um, what type of cause you have, so on and so forth, and it's like a star rating. You get one star up to five stars. So I wanted to talk about the diversification of the funding sources. So we found out when we did our assessment that we were not very diversified in our funding. As I had mentioned, $1.3 million of our $2.6 million budgets comes from two events. So we're in trouble. So we had to start looking at where do we diversify and how do we diversify. So to me, it's the key to longevity of an organization. Without diversification, you can get yourself in trouble. And it's a balanced and measurable way to look at your operating expenses and your cash flow. So you can say X amount is going to come in through an event, X amount may come in through a foundation, X amount may come in through individuals, X amount may come in through corporations. And so that's where you can start to broaden your scope. And we'll talk about each of these next. How many of you in the audience do events? Okay. And do they span small like a walkathon? You can call it out if you want, a gala. Golf tournament, that's a big one that costs a lot of money, put on a golf tournament. Music festival, okay. Oh, I like my husband would like that, he rides a Harley. All right, so different, different ways of fundraising. Okay, so events, I always hit easy but tough, and those of you with the golf tournament and such, it's, it is very hard. So I always say, though, that they need to appeal to the audience. We have various ones. We have um, the black and white gala, which mostly couples attend, that tend to be traditionally sort of in that age demographic of about 50 and over. Um, we have a large luncheon that we do and fashion show. 600 women usually come, uh, but mostly women. And it's um, more of a fun type of event. Our black and white gala raises a million dollars, nets a million dollars, and our fashion show nets about 300. So, but the audience isn't the same. So you have to appeal to your audience. We do smaller events like shopping events and things like that that appeal to, to a different type of audience. Uh, we do a deaf, here in Newport, for those of you that are from here, we do a Duffy Boat Challenge for corporations where they can do team building, but they just it happens to benefit CASA. And then we do community partnerships uh, with like a symphony group and things like that that half proceeds would benefit CASA. So we negotiate kind of the proceeds from different things. But each one appeals to a different segment and a different audience. Obviously, with events, you need a large volunteer base that can help you execute these because it costs money. We have a group of 225 fundraising volunteers, which are separate than our children's advocates. And that's all they do is help us with logistics. They are the committee. They're the ones going out and helping fundraise, bringing their friends to the events, selling tickets, um, getting new sponsors for us. Uh, it's tough to market sometimes. We do a lot of marketing, obviously, on website and word of mouth. Um, again, the balance of the percent of expenses to revenues. The one thing we found in a lot of things I heard when I first came on our black and white gala is it's, it, rather grand. Most of it, luckily, is sponsored and donated. But the perception 
when people walk in that ballroom is like, whoa, it's at the Ritz Carlton and all the money I just gave to this organization is going to pay for us to be at the Ritz Carlton eating steak and lobster and having a professional singer up on stage. So we make a point of trying to get the message out to our donors that most of the things that they see that evening are donated. And it's mostly because of our fundraising volunteers that are able to go out and do this. But extremely important because it could be a negative thing when they see how much goes into an event. So that's just something to manage. And then how many are you going to do? You can oversaturate your donors with too many things to do. Um, the, our volunteers, our fundraising volunteers, really like to go shopping. So we had a ton of shopping events, but how many shopping events can you really go to and feel like you have to buy something? So we needed to stop doing that, and now we limit it to four a year rather than it felt like there was one practically every month. And I know there was a, my husband was very unhappy <laughs> about me continuing to go to those. Um, and then... Consider partner th partnering with other organizations if you're just starting out. Like someone had mentioned a music festival, um, you know, pr going to one that's already organized that could benefit, that they would be willing to do 20% of proceeds would go back to your cause, something like that. Maybe an established golf tournament where you can partner with them for your cause or split it with someone um, or a like you know, a like cause or two of you getting together and doing it together. Um, different ways to save money, and if you've never done an event, a good way to start out doing an event and not having to worry about every single thing on that checklist. So individuals and corporations. We had a lot of people say, well, how do you find the people? Hopefully you have a decent database, and you can mine that database. So when I came on board, um, my executive team and I sat down with a database, which was not very robust at all. There was, you know, a database is only as good as what you put in it. And, um, but we went through it, and we kept going through it, and we just kept writing down names, and who do we actually know? Can we ask our board of directors? Do they know who these people are on the list? And we got through it little by little and started finding individuals. Um, Oftentimes, it's your board of directors, or if you don't have a board of directors, if you're very small, maybe you have one or two advisors that help you in business. And who do they know? It's their network that can assist you. We comb the community business journal here in Orange County. It's the Orange County Community Business or Orange County Business Journal. They're fantastic to telling for telling you um, who just bought a large building, who just got a promotion, who just went to another philanthropy board and you sniff all that out. You got to be part investigator in order to find the individuals. They're a lot tougher to find. Um, I put other like organizations because, um, well, to be honest, sometimes you just got to go out there and steal good people. So we see who other people support and if they're supporting other children's agencies, perhaps they'll support ours too. And perhaps there's enough money to go around. But we do look to see who is supporting other like agencies in the community. And then obviously an introduction to the cause. Do they know about it? Do they have any idea uh, what it is? And then corporation, what we found is we're trying to find corporations within our community that have a like cause or a like mission. So what's interesting is you may think to yourself, Taco Bell, and we actually are, one of our board members is the CFO of Taco Bell, and it happens to be that their mission is to support teenagers within the community. Well, that is right up our alley because most of our kids are between the ages of 12 and 18. And so that's how we were able to partner with Taco Bell, a very large, large um, corporation. We mostly look to mid and large size corporations. The smaller ones tend to fall more of a, even though they're a corporation, into the individual category because they're so small you really need to go one-on-one -on -one with them. 
Um, if you are looking at corporations, we're looking for people with the title of corporate giving officer to try to connect with, um, oftentimes an HR individual, um, a global citizen department. They're called all sorts of different things, so we have a list of what they're called so that we know when we're calling in to ask for a specific department or a specific title it tends to get you in easier to a corporation. Um, and most larger corporations have a corporate foundation for giving. So one of our board members um, sits, is from Wells Fargo. She runs a different division for them, but she was able to introduce us to their foundation, and they're completely separate than what the bank is and what she does. So that's important as well. And then most communities have a community foundation Ours was originally founded to help uh, develop boards of directors and things like that. At this point, they're managing large foundational family money, and we partner with them. We have one like account executive. He knows everything about CASA there is to know so that he can recommend to a family who's looking to invest in a charitable organization. He can tee CASA up as one of those that they may be interested in giving to. And then grants and foundations, this was our biggest impact for CASA in how we diversified. The key is researching. There's so many out there that you would never know about. You just gotta keep, you know, get on the website, get on the internet, put in every single keyword possible that relates back to what your cause is and what you're raising money for. <clears throat> They're usually looking for a very specific niche to give money. So be careful when you're doing that application to that you're speaking to what they're specifically looking for. Um, again, beware of the restricted assets. If you're not in a financial position that it's gonna, their foundational giving will only speak to one aspect uh, of your budget, beware of that. Community grants, this is often easier to go to a community uh, grant. Uh, they're looking for people specifically within your small community that they want to give money to. They may not give anywhere outside of, let's say, Orange County. They may not give anywhere outside of even smaller than that a particular city, not just a county. So always look into community grants. And meet with your grantors. We um, were told when I first came on board that sometimes the reason they weren't giving again is because they had never met anybody that ran the place. So get out there and go to coffee, go to lunch. Uh, we have a philosophy that we do not take donors or foundations out for dinner and there's never alcohol involved. We will only take for coffee in the mornings or lunch. Um, we do not spend a lot of money. We go to like Panera Bread and get a sandwich. And I think that the donors respect that because we're not spending a lot of money. Um, we limit everything to one hour. Um, and if we're going to a corporation, we usually go to their office and do a professional PowerPoint presentation. Um, not to take that CEO or that HR director out of their office. So we go to them to make it convenient. Um, think about when you're doing an application, the, your organizational description. You don't have to recreate the wheel every single time you do an application. Go through, pull one off the internet, look to see what the basics are. Typically, they're asking for you to describe what your organization is or what your cause is. Um, a need statement. Why is it that you're going to ask for this money and what does this money go to pay for? What kind of goals do you have for the money? What will this money actually do? And then maybe a success story, maybe something that, you know, in previous years, this type of donation allowed us to serve or help or fund the need for X amount of children, X amount of procedures, X amount of genetic testing, something like that. Give them like something succinct. Um, and then be specific about your funding request. How much money is it? And you may also want what we found, rather than putting out like, oh, 5,000, 10,000, which is kind of typical when you see things, actually give them a budget of something, like $1,295, and explain how you got to $1,295. We often will get calls from the person that's granting the money, reviewing the application, and they say to us, 
how'd you come up with 1295? That's such an odd number. I go, well, if you look at the paragraph below, we described what it actually will go for and pay for. And they're like, no one's ever done that. So we caught their interest. They may not give us the money, but they caught, we at least caught their interest and they paid attention to it. So that's a different way of differentiating yourself from the other hundreds of applications that might be coming into that foundation. And then your budget. Make sure you know it. Make sure you have it. Make sure that you can attach it so that they can see what your revenues and expenses are for the year. And you can always, if it's sometime in the middle of your year, you can always you know, attach the one from your prior. But just make sure that you have substantiated um, budget for them to review. So quickly, um, tools and tips. Database, there's a ton out there. We happen to use Salesforce. Everybody will tell you, especially in fundraising, that Razor's Edge is the gold standard for um, any sort of uh, fundraising. It's expensive. It's about $30,000 with a $15,000 annual fee that goes with it after that. We could not afford it. But a database is only as good as what you put in it. So you don't need something that's expensive. As long as you know name, where they're from, know their donor history, um, little things about them. When's their birthday? How many children do they have? The last time someone visited with them or called them is important, and who did it? What events they've attended on your behalf? And then who's their connection? How did they get connected to your cause to begin with? Was it through a board member? Was it through a mutual friend? Um, did they come to something like this and hear about it? Did they read an article? You know, anything like that. And that will all give you good information to start that relationship or continue that relationship with them. So you can't do it alone. We found this out. When I was a board member for CASA, we hired a CEO. And in order to save money, she told us she could do all the fundraising herself. $2.6 million of fundraising all by herself. Kind of hard to do. So um, she got worn out <laughs> and left. And we were in trouble. So. Um, Please don't do it alone or think that you can. So consider a board of directors or advisors. These are non-paid community uh, professionals. Uh, I always say establish a criteria of the type of person that you want, meaning that if you have deficiencies, maybe you yourself aren't that great at doing a budget or you don't know legalities or you don't know something about you know, how to navigate through hospitals or things like that, find people with that's their background. We have attorneys, um, financial people. That, you know, I wanted a lot of finance guys on my board because they keep me accountable and they keep my books clean. And they ask me a lot of tough questions. Um, and they have a network. These people, your board of directors, should have a huge network within the community and be able to introduce you and your cause to other people, which is extremely import important. They'll market for you and they'll fundraise for you. And they also have fiduciary duty if they're an actual board of director, which means that they're going to be watching your bottom line probably just as much as you are. Um, I say train them on your mission because now that they're your marketeer, if they don't understand how to talk about what you do and what you need, they can cause more trouble than they're worth. So make sure they understand how to explain what you do. And then I always say work together with them on what is your philosophy on how to cultivate a donor or get to know somebody? They may be a great board of director, but you put them out there socially, and they may not be that great. So you want to make sure that they represent you the way you want to be represented, represented in how you want to ask for money. So you may want to tell them, don't ask for money right off the bat. Take it a little bit slower. We're a little more conservative than that. And they should be able to follow kind of your guideline on that. Do it in their own personal way, but follow a few things that you would like them to do. And then always arm them with information. They're probably not hands-on in doing exactly what you're doing and meeting the children that you're advocating on behalf of. So give them some stories that they can talk to their friends about and say, you know, this is what they're doing there. Then, as I mentioned, ongoing communication, just those quarterly updates of any kind that you can email to donors. We do a very simple annual report. It's simply to all of our donors, it's by email. It simply states how much we've made, how much we've spent. 
We do a monthly e-news that's just more fun facts about what's going on in the organization and some pictures about things that we've done. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone. We do, if someone's made a donation, we have a tax letter that goes out within 48 hours to them. Um, with their information. We do a lot of personalized and handwritten cards and it takes hours and hours. I sit up at night and personalize all of our thank you notes that go out, write a lot of personal thank you cards and I do get thank yous back from people so they do read them. I think they're shocked to get something in the mail nowadays. And then we do, we split this up but we call or email um, to a donor if they've made a certain dollar amount donation and that is very specific to how much you raise. We do if someone has made a thousand dollar donation, usually one of our advancement team uh, will call. If they made over a five thousand dollar donation, I will call personally and say thank you. And I may just leave a message and never actually speak to the person, but I want them to hear that we've acknowledged what they've done for us and how far that money goes. And that's it. <laughs> so, um, thank you. We, we have time for one or two questions. Any questions? One I know that qu was fast. That was quick. <laughs> so that was great information. Thank you so much. My question is about the staying under 20% of expenses for an event, which I'm totally for. We try to even keep it lower. My challenge is we have a like an annual kickoff uh -huh. event that actually kicks off all the fundraising for our big event. The big event in the fall raises over 100000 but the kickoff event's not designed to raise any, but it averages about 20000 and the expenses are in the three, four, 5000 It doesn't have a huge, um, you know, there's a lot more percentage of expense. Uh -huh. So is that, would that really fall under the... The big event, or you know, or, or is that not good to have it as a separate name? So we we do something similar. Some of those shopping events that we do lead up to our large fashion show because we're trying to get the designer name out there and get people to you know purchase. Mm -hmm. And so we tie it into the large event because ultimately it funnels into that large event. As long as you can show that there's a tie back to the large event that it's funneling into that, then you should be fine. Okay. Thanks. One more question? Anybody have a question? Pending question? Okay. Well, thank, thank you very you much. Thank you all of you. Hope Round that you enjoy your conference. <laughs>